Over to Nadira, ready for our workshop. Thank you very much, Nadira. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Just let me know if you can see my screen. We can. Yeah, thank you. So welcome all. So before going to my talk, I'm Nadira. Nadira Nazneen Rocky, who is doing my TFL project in Biology Department of University of Oxford. So before going to my talk, I would go to the background of my life. So I have come from a very distant place from UK. I have been born and, born and brought up in Bangladesh, where I did my undergraduate and graduate degree, Masters in Microbiology from University of Dhaka. Then I uh, did uh, some undergraduate graduate teaching in different city in a different university, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman Science and Technology University. And then from there, I joined my alma mater, University of Dhaka, again for teaching. And after all these, actually, I came here and I thought as I have been the first one who came out of country for studying, I thought no one knows Bangladesh, but it seems most of the people knows. So even if you know, these are some beautiful pictures of my trekking when I was back in Bangladesh. And if you were interested in trekking, I might need to tell you that they are all done in rainy season and in rainy season all the tracks are extremely slippery and you have to be very very careful otherwise you may slip and go all the way down to the hill and anything might happen so these are some more some more my trekking picture which i used to love to do that now i can't do it here i can't find those things or can't find the opportunity so then i flew all the way to the uk to study here, University of Oxford, and my PhD program is funded by the Commonwealth Scholarship, which is a UK scholarship you might know. So this is my lab, not my department. If you uh, think that's because we are a huge group of uh, people. Um, so this is my whole lab. So I'm working on my antibiotic resistance. So uh, it's although I'm affiliated to University of um, Oxford Biology, Department, but my lab is in the Dunn School, Dunn School of Pathology in this university. So I would start my favorite story. Even though I would eventually go to the infectious diseases, one of my most favorite stories is the Odzi the Iceman. So in 1991, two mountaineers happened to found a dead body in the Alps mountain. So what they thought it was just a recent dead body who was just a mountaineer like them. But what they didn't realize actually, this was a mummy and it was about 5,000 year old mummy. So it was not a recent body, which was just a mountaineer. It was really, really an, or an, an ancient grandpa. So this is the grandpa as he was found in Odzal uh, mountain. So he's, na uh, he's named Odzi and uh, he was supposed to look like this. But the most interesting thing I found about him is the scientific advancement or the interest of researchers. So when they investigated what was the last meal of Odzi, what was in their stomach content, they got some interesting finding. One of the finding, as you can see, this is uh, beautiful cartoons. Um, the last meal of Odzi was some uh, corn, some fangas, some uh, red, um, red meat or something like that. But as a microbiologist, what caught my attention is they found Helicobacter pylori, which is a bacteria which is a known causative agent of peptic ulcer and which can eventually lead to cancer. So even if he died by an accident, by the shot in his back, he was not really a very healthy man. He was suffering from actually peptic ulcer, which could be cancer eventually, but not then. So that's the interesting point, how science advanced. That's because when 
first the scientist or the first the person, Anthony Van Leeuwen, who saw this um, bacteria under the microscope. As you can see, he was just, just using a normal lenses to see all the things he can magnify. And this is the picture what I can now see under the microscope. But the people, they didn't see these things. These are totally invisible invisible world so it was not easy to make them understand these organisms can co uh, can cause any disease like helicobacter pylori can cause peptic ulcer rather they believe in miasma theory so miasma theory is the theory of disease how the disease was occurring in them so they believed Actually, diseases are caused by bad air. Even the word malaria, malaria came from mal and area, which means bad air. So they believed any diseases they are causing from bad air, bad water. So here you can see a doctor who's dressed up in all uh, cloaks and everything, and he he's used to treat patient with this get up so that he, he can't get in touch of that bad air. And eventually, actually, this miasma theory worked in a way as he was all covered. He was covered and secured from many of the uh, organisms or germs. Suppose one of the most famous um, or most successful example of miasma theory is the smart sanitation. So in the USA, the sanitation system them, who did the tremendous work and fantastic work on sanitation and drainage system, he himself believed in miasma theory. He thought bad air can cause the diseases. So he planned the drainage in a way so that the bad swamp or bad air cannot accumulate in a place and can cause the disease spreading. So actually, people believe this miasma theory. People didn't get the theory of microorganism doing diseases or something. They didn't believe that, actually. So the person who first made them all realized or scientifically proved that a germ, a bacteria, a virus can cause disease was Robert Koch. So what he did. So suppose you are a scientist or you are a researcher. Now you need to prove that a bacteria can cause disease. How can you do that? How could he do that? So he took a disease, which is the anthrax disease, and it's common in cows, uh, even it can be in human, and it's caused by bacillus anthracis bacteria. So he wanted to correlate bacillus anthracis to anthrax. And he actually proposed a postulate, which had four postulates, and he gave an idea how you can correlate a germ to a disease. So the first postulate or the first proposal was look into all sick individuals and look into their body, look into their blood cells or look into their symptoms. If he is caused by a germ, if this disease is caused by a germ, this germ will be present in all the sick individuals. So in case of his case, uh, which was the diseased cows. So he tried to look at all the diseased cows who had this anthrax and then tried to find out this bacteria bacillus anthracis in all these cases. Here you can see a mice. If you want to see, this is a healthy mice. So when you look under the microscope, it's blood. There will be no germ. It will be just red blood cells. That's because it's totally healthy. And if you grow them in artificial environment in the lab, in this lab plate or the growth medium where the bacteria can grow, there will be nothing. That's because it's a healthy mouse. But when you take a diseased organism and you look under the microscope, there will be something extra under the microscope and that will be something germ and this germ should be present in all cases which is the first postulate of Cox and the second thing he 
as he was a researcher, he was not just happy with that. He said you have to culture them in laboratories so that you can prove this blood is contaminated by a germ or this animal is contaminated by any germ. So you have to, in second step, you have to culture this bacteria, virus, or whatever germ you think is causing the disease. And the interesting thing is, as he was a researcher, he, his uh, postulate didn't end like only finding. He proposed if this bacteria can cause the disease, you have to inject this bacteria into healthy individual to see if they really got, dizzy, got the disease. So as, as he proposed, so um, he checked all the cows who were sick, checked if the bacteria was present, and he grew the bacteria in the laboratory environment, giving them food and environment, everything it needed, and then isolated this bacteria and pushed them into a healthy animal, and then observed if this animal is sick or it's healthy. Interestingly, this animal would be dead, that's because that's the pathogenic organism or that can cause the disease. So his postulate, the fourth and final one would be, you have to take the blood of these healthy volunteer who eventually got sick and then grow the bacteria from his blood. So now you can take this organism from your previous one from where you have infected this organism and check if they are the same. If they are the same, then you can say this is the causative agent of the disease. So this is the darn theory. This was the first theory which actually correlated microorganism to any disease. Before that, there was debate if it's miasma, if it's germ, if it's water, air, whatever. But after his work, it was proved that the bacillus anthracis can cause the disease. So following his Cox postulates, not only bacillus anthracis, many of the organisms and many of the germs now we know can cause diseases. And it is still applicable to, um, to any of the germs you can find or they are emerging. So the thing is, now you have the problem. The problem is that, uh, sorry, I had to mention that earlier that you can vote it. Uh, if you uh, uh, scan the QR code, uh, you can answer the question. So the question is very simple question. You have to think of, suppose this is the AIDS research or this is the Ebola research, which is very little research and you want to know if HIV virus is causing the disease or if HIV is the causative agent. Would you really be interested to get infected by AIDS or Ebola or even COVID-19 or any of the new uh, disease or germs? Will you be interested to get it inside your body to just check? Uh, if it really causes the disease or not. That's because according to Cox postulate, you have to inject a healthy individual for this, uh, you know, proving this theory. As my graph says, most of them says no, they will not voluntarily participate for this type of research where they will be uh, infected with some unknown diseases or very lethal or very pathogenic diseases. And that's the wise thing, I guess. Who said, yes, I want to have a good, not a good news, but news for them that they are not the alone person who would be interested in daring, doing these daring things. There are other people doing those things, the crazy people. So the crazy people, Dr. Barry Marshall, who proved the Helicobacter pylori can peptic ulcer or cancer. Even though germ theory was there, everything was there, nobody believed cancer was caused caused by a bacteria. It was not possible. 
and as Helicobacter pylori cannot usually cause any infection in any other um, animal like monkey or anything else, how can you prove Helicobacter pylori can cause the disease of peptic ulcer? The most convenient answer would be just drink some Helicobacter pylori and check if you get the peptic ulcer or not. What Dr. Barry Marshall did actually, which is not the ideal practice or which is very crazy stuff as researchers are sometimes. So what he did, he drank the uh, Helicobacter pylori and then he showed the symptoms of peptic ulcer then they take medicine and then get cured and but he followed the cox postulate exactly the same way he drank it he uh, uh, tested his stomach contain and found the bacteria and then he proved everyone that helicobacter pylori can cause the peptic ulcer and he eventually got the nobel prize for it so uh, his hard work got paid off i must say but if you think like uh, he did it that because he was a researcher, he was interested and he was interested to take that risk. Do you think it would be ethical to infect human intentionally for any research purposes, especially when uh, you just don't know what this disease would be like uh, when this COVID appeared, when this pandemic appeared? I we never knew that what could be the thing do you think it's just a yes or no answer do you think it would be ethical for them to just um, just infect anyone that's because you want to prove a theory or if you just you want to check what happens Definitely. My answer would be no. Even if I want to take the responsibility, even if I want to um, that's the thing. Yeah, that's a good point. If voluntarily, uh, yes, and definitely there are lots of diseases. There are lots of vaccines, even the COVID-19 vaccines, but those got tested on human subjects. That's because and this this all were voluntarily. And yeah, science does that. That's because we have to fight the disease. So we had to do some voluntarily, but still there is an ethical op uh, a window there is always how many people you can get infected how many mouse model animal model you can use so these all things you have to think about first then you can go for the ethical ones that's because you can't just uh, infect anyone for proving your own theory you can't just kill people but yes definitely we accept human volunteers with uh, their consent for some reasons as you already know or already think. So there's a problem with this uh, Cox postulate then. There is another problem and I think you can already see if the, uh, there is another problem with this Cox postulate. It's the simplest <laughs> answer as you have already seen there is no person who didn't have didn't fever we all had fever so now as a researcher think you want to correlate fever with a germ oh there's one person who had never got fever that's interesting he's okay i'm interested about this person and wanted to test uh, uh, his or her blood so my next question is what was your cause for this fever? I want to, as a researcher, now we want to correlate this fever with a specific germ. So if you want to correlate it with any germ, as the Cox postulate's first postulate was, it would be present in all diseased cases. That's an interesting thing, as you can see, Fever was present in COVID-19, it was present in flu, it was present in vaccine, which is an immune response, which is not a, that sort of disease, but still it was present in chickenpox. And interestingly, some got fever out of the fear of exams. So if you uh, want to prove that COVID-19 is caused by SARS-CoV-2 virus. 
Can you really correlate with this question? That's because fever was present in all cases. So this disease symptom was present in all cases. That's a problem actually. That's because for Cox postulate, the first, uh, first condition was that all the disease condition in all them, there would be one single germ. Now you can see the people who has COVID, the people who has uh, chicken pox germ, the people who has no germ at all out of fear, they all have this uh, fever. So that makes our Cox postulate a little bit problematic to apply in nowadays. That's because there are too many limitations. The first limitation that we can't actually culture all the organisms in the laboratory environment. We are not smart enough, but one smart alternative could be animal model that what we use like monkeys, mouse and everything. Still, there are some limitations and one of the major thing is. A single disease could be caused by different pathogens and a single pathogen can cause a different disease condition, especially for TB. It could be lung TB, it could be bone TB, it could be in the skin and anywhere. And definitely the ethical consideration. We can't just uh, take human for all causes or we can't just kill all the animals for our own uh, research purposes or something. So this uh, Cox postulates need some modification to overcome these limitations. Any idea of how this could be overcome or anything, uh, even if I don't know if there's any idea you are proposing, but what is the most fascinating thing over the years is the DNA sequencing technology. Once we could sequence everything, we are including human genome, including bacteria, including virus. This has been really, really helpful. So now we are applying this Cox postulate, absolutely the old Cox postulates, but only now we don't correlate the germ directly with the disease, rather than we correlate the genomic material of the germ with the disease. So now we don't look for the germ, like uh, what happened with COVID or what happened with the AIDS or what happened, anything. We would not look for the specific viruses always if we can't. We can just really do the sequencing and check if this um, viral genome or bacterial genome, germ genome, DNA is present in all cases. Something like that, very simple. Like um, um, COVID was supposed to be a lung, a lung infection, so your virus would be in the lung rather than in your muscle. So if you take your muscle cell and do the DNA sequencing, you would not get much virus or any virus in muscle cell, but in the lung, definitely you will have this um, DNA of these germs. So that's the co modified Cox postulate. So it makes our life much more easier rather than the old one. That's because um, uh, you can't always take a human or any animal model, or you cannot always grow bacteria or virus uh, in laboratory con condition, but you can uh, sequence them. That's an interesting thing. And that makes li our life easier. That's because if you just consider the last pandemic, how fast we developed everything, we found out our causative agent, we found out the vaccine and the vaccine was working fine. And now you see we have already we have already won this war actually. So that's the interesting thing. But that's the how researchers development uh, developed the path from the miasma theory to this pandemic. And if you see the microbial world Actually, it's very diverse, it's very complex. The more we know, the more we get confused. That because uh, we didn't know about this bacteria or viruses before, like this giant viruses. We all know viruses are the smallest or smallest organism in the world, so virus would be this small, but eventually we have these giant viruses which are actually size of a bacteria. Even the bacteria, they could be actually become giant, very much giant. 
that's because whenever you want to define a microorganism, if, you, I, if I ask you or if you ask me what is a microorganism, the first definition I would give, it's like you can't see it with your naked eyes. If it's so micro, it's so little to be seen. So you have to see it under the microscope. But interestingly, there are giant bacteria and you can see this giant bacteria are really, really giant and they're huge. You can see it in, I mean, uh, they, are, they can be up to the size of a fly, so you can easily see them. So that's an interesting world, actually, especially if you consider the polar region where there are all ice and with the global uh, warming, these ice are getting warm and new viruses, new bacteria are released from there. We never, we really, really don't know what are, what are in front of us, actually what could be the future. So if we know so many things, are we really, really ready for the next pandemic? What could be the next pandemic? That's the question. What do you think? What can cause the pandemic? Or if there is any chance of pandemic, that's because there are always emerging viruses, bacteria, and everything. Uh, I, I haven't got any response. Oh, this. Ooh. Okay. Okay. Yes. So yeah, definitely. There could be any viruses. They are very, very much evolving. They have high mutation rate. So the next pandemic could be a virus. There could be a genetic event, definitely from animal. We could have these viruses or bacteria from us and the disease and definitely, definitely antibiotic resistance. What we say antibiotic resistance is the next pandemic. Actually, in the real world, if you see the data, it's the pandemic what's happening right at this moment, right now. That's because and we say this is this is going to be the source of the next pandemic. Actually, this poultry farms or any animal farming would be the next source of pandemic that we think. And why we think I'm coming to that later, but if we know what is antibiotic resistance. So what if we know what is antibiotic? A very simple answer to this question, it is a drug which can kill the germ. As we have the germ theory, now we know this germ can cause the disease. So if you have the COVID, if you have the chicken box, if you have the dysentery, you need the drug for this treatment. And that drug is antibiotic. It is not like a paracetamol or any type of drugs that that's not targeting or killing anything. It's actively killing or um, uh, decreasing the growth of this bacteria. So this is like normal bacteria, what it's supposed to be. These are antibiotic discs. So the white zone, these are uh, bacterial layer. So if you give them this antibiotic, they are all supposed to die actually. So this is the normal scenario. This is what should happen but interestingly now if you just collect bacteria from anywhere from your doorknob to toilet seat from hospital everywhere if you collect this bacteria and grow them in presence of these drugs you will see this drug cannot actually kill the bacteria these are not killing these are not killing they are not killing even who can kill this bacteria they are actually not very much effective in killing this one is killing but not as effective or not making as a large clearing zone like this ones so this is the antibiotic resistance and if you see this 2019 report about 1.2 million people died because of this antibiotic resistant bacterial infection so we are waiting for the next pandemic but we are ignoring the fact that there's already a pandemic happening that's because there are lots of antibiotic resistance and um, uh, the previous antibiotics are not working and why 
these antibiotics are not working and you can see how they are becoming resistant. So when you are getting infected, all are different strain. These green ones are sensitive. They can be killed by the antibiotics, but these ones somehow got some mutation or something. That's why they're not getting killed. And so if you stop now antibiotic, or these one will grow much more better. And now this will transfer this resistance strain to other uh, sensitive strain and they will make the whole population resistant. That's the much more frightening thing. That's because this resistance trait is pretty much mobile. They can make this whole or different type of bacteria totally resistant. So why this is so big problem if drugs are getting resistant you should just develop a new drug penicillin was uh, discovered in 1940 this is coming 2040 so all these years why we are not making more drugs the typical answer would be if you just look at the drug development process if you start from thousand compound which could be the drug and screen them if they have the uh, power to kill the germs, you will find out only a small percentage of compounds that has this antibacterial or anti-infective activity. But that's not the problem. 250 compound is not bad, actually. It's a good number. It's a huge number. The problem is they are again cut in these preclinical trials in which they are actually, most of these drugs, not only toxic to these germs, are toxic to human body as well. So after these preclinical trials in which you are trying to see if this is actually working or if it is killing the human as well, or something, something, toxicity, efficacy and everything, you test in the lab, only five to eight compound come from this batch, maybe five. And these five need to go through these clinical trials. Interestingly, these clinical trials could be long. That's because first you have to take a small number of volunteers to check only the safety, if it is safe to eat. And then you'll go to the phase two, where you would be tested them on the patients, if it is really a drug or not, if it's really working in human body or not. Then you have to take actually a large number of patients to check if it's working really, really in a statistically significant way or not. And then you will get the FDA approval and then you will get the actually drug and only one drug. From this 10,000 compound, you are getting one drug and it takes at least 10 years to get there. So it's a long time journey. It's time consuming. It's very much expensive and everything and it's been almost or more than 50 years we haven't have any new FDA approval of these antibiotics so if you see the antibiotic discovery data you would be seeing that this is the golden age all the antibiotics were discovered in between these times. And as the time goes, people are getting much more interested to work on other drugs, rather cancer drugs, diabetic drugs, something. That's because there's lots of money in them. In case of antibiotic, if you just prescribe them once, you get, uh, uh, you just uh, become good. You don't get infected again, and you won't need the antibiotic again if you don't get infected again. So that's not much more commercially viable. So there's a lots of issues of uh, one is it's very expensive, two it's not commercially very profitable so they are not very much or the industrialists are not very much interested in antibiotics and eventually we are having no discovery of drugs on the other hand we are having a high antibiotic resistance so that's the thing. What do you think? What is your responsibility? You can prevent the antibiotic resistance. But before I, uh, you, I see the responses, I want to um, definitely uh, complete the course, give out less uh, antibiotics, take the full course. But I want to ask you one single thing. If you have noticed the next 
pandemic would be caused by the poultry farm? And why do you think I'm saying that? Is there any reason or is there any possibility these are coming from poultry or any animal farming? The thing is what we can't realize that for any type of poultry farming or any type of any animal farming for the cows, dairy and everything. They give a lots of lots of antibiotics in these animals and that's only for the growth promotion as they are um, raising in a herd. So it's very much difficult to isolate an individual animal or individual chicken and then treat them. Rather, you can just eat them all, you, you can just treat them all with antibiotics so they will not be infected. That's the measure idea. But the problem with this idea is that even if you were a vegan, you don't take the antibiotics, so you were free from um, and taking antibiotics. But that's not the case, actually. That's not really the case. That's because this antibiotic getting washed away um, in water, it's getting into the food chain, and ultimately you are taking the antibiotics unknowingly, even if you are not taking that food which is contaminated with the antibiotics or which is cooked already. So these antibiotics are not causing anything. That's the problem, and that's the, one of the major problems of antibiotic resistance. That's why we say it will be coming from the um, uh, poultry farm. Now we can focus on the antibiotic resistance prevention. So you have already uh, pointed out you sh should have the take full course. The course is always there. Uh, don't over prescribe drugs, take in correct doses, definitely all prescribed drug and everything. Actually, yeah, you have already correctly uh, eat less animal product. Okay, some of them they suggest eat less animal product or be completely vegan. But as I said, it's not always from eating, rather it's the farming, the way we farm the animals, the way we use the antibiotics for raising these animals, it's wrong. That concept is wrong. That's because that same antibiotic is, is pres prescribed for human as well, and they can be washed away into water and they could come into the food chain and everything, and indirectly you will be in come in contact with this antibiotic resistant organism. So sometimes that's it. Yeah, not using agriculture, it's a good one. That's because, yeah, definitely you should not or actually early, rationally use these antibiotics in anywhere where there is not infection to be treated. So this is the definitely we already know. So this is the WHO prescribed uh, things, what you can do to prevent antibiotic resistance, but there is as I said, the more we know, the more we get confused. So the bottom line theory is that if you are getting in, infected and you are taking antibiotics for treating that infection, eventually from this treatment, some of this resistance will arise. That's because these germs, these bacteria are very much uh, smart. They will find it away. But the thing to mention or the thing to uh, think is that we have some very common misconception. Even I haven't found any prevention here as well, is that we take antibiotics sometimes in viral infection as well, even in flu. But antibiotics are fully focused on bacteria as bacteria and virus is structurally different. Antibiotic cannot work on virus mainly, but in some cases, like in COVID cases, uh, azithromycin, which is an antibiotic, was prescribed and treated, and that had a very good effect on the outcome rate. But that doesn't mean that antibiotic to work on the virus. That's because that antibiotic had some uh, 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 co-infection uh, cases or had some antiviral activity. So that's a di totally different case. That's not the case, usual case. Usually antibiotics are not effective against virus. So viral flu, whenever we catch cold, which is usually the viral flu or viral thing, you should don't just take antibiotic for those cases and the rest of them you already actually know. So yeah, 
so this is the broadly thing I had. Now the floor is all yours. You can ask me any question. I will take and would love to discuss any idea or anything. I can uh, stop sharing now, right? That's right. So if you'd like to write your questions in the chat, then Nadira will pick them up from there. Thanks, Nadira. Thanks. Let me check that. OK, Barry Marshall. Uh, so I can type. So one of the questions on the chat book was, um, can you remind me what's the name of the man got the Nobel Prize because of drinking the bacteria himself? It's a very good story if you want to know. Actually, I love this man and his idea. So it's Barry Marshall who invented or who discovered the thing that uh, Helicobacter pylori can cause uh, a peptic ulcer or which is the which eventually can cause the better, uh, sorry, uh, peptic cancer as well. I will write the name here, Barry J. Marshall. Okay. Uh, to what extent do you think infectious diseases had a role in colonization? I don't get the question properly. Colonization of what? Are the cox is still in use in labs or is a different technique used? Definitely cox postulate is still the classic experiment, but only in the cases where it is possible to do. Just like as I said, you can't infect a human with COVID-19 at the first place. So you better use the modified cox postulate. You just check the sequences and then check what are the is causing uh, isn't or something like that. So that's the more convenient way to do. But if you have, if you are interested, you can still use that if that's possible. Do you think resistance enzyme inhibitors are a better solution than bacteriophage therapy to combat the anti antibiotic resistant crisis. That's an excellent question. That's because the phase therapy was used in 18 something or in um, past and we thought antibiotic is the magic bullet. We don't need the phase anymore. But now when all the antibiotics are getting resistant and we are not getting enough antibiotic or new antibiotic effective ones, we are now looking into phases again. So um, Time will only say, uh, definitely enzyme inhibitors. There are lots of research, even my group also researching on both these inhibitors and phase therapy. So time will only say, I have no idea. Whichever works, works. It's something like that. It uh, depends. What is your opinion on how or if we should be making new antibiotics? Definitely we should, we should. That's because even if you know uh, there are some last resort drugs. It means uh, when you are infected and you are trying to um, treat this infection with antibiotics and no antibiotics is working, there are several classes of antibiotics we use then, which are called last resort, uh, which should be uh, effective in all infections or those infections. But uh, alarmingly, these last resorts are getting resistant as well. So there should be uh, more research on antibiotics or phase therapy or something like that so that we can have any, anything to combat this um, resistance. That's because otherwise it will die. Uh, that's a story. In Oxford, uh, a person died from a scratch of a rose bush. That's because uh, that infection, we didn't have the antibiotic to treat. So it's not very unusual to go back to that time if antibiotics are no, not working. Um, to what extent can genetic engineering influence the impact of bacterial resistance? So genetic engineering helping us a lot for starting those uh, resistant rates or um, uh, or how can we overcome the resistance, something like that. But there's another risk of this um, 
uh, engineered organism who can escape from the lab and cause much more uh, diseases. So we have to be very careful with that and maintaining all the safety procedures. But definitely, it's an uh, it's a very strong tool to study these things. Uh, is encouraging better general health in order to reduce reliance on drug when infected with disease uh, that the body's immune system can be uh, going to be important in the future. So that's an interesting actually thing to think. Uh, that's because now, though we are talking about antibiotics, I don't know if you know, maybe you know, probably you all know about the probiotics, which are like normal yogurts. Those yogurts has different uh, good microbes, good bacteria in it. So this good bacteria help you to fight the diseases. So many, many diseases, many, many infectious diseases has a good recovery rate when you take these probiotics with antibiotics or even if no antibiotics at all. If your gut microbiota are really, really healthy or really strong, that has sometimes effect on your recovery. Definitely that has an effect on your recovery rate, but sometimes that could be very much helpful for um, any uh, infectious diseases. So uh, immunity is important. Boosting your immunity with these uh, probiotics could be a good thing rather than, rather than on relying solely on treatment. Definitely a good practice. Can we determine all properties of the bacteria just from their genetic material? So there's two terms. One is genotype and phenotype. So genotype, like a gene, uh, it says like uh, you have gene for your hair color. It has the green gene, so your ha uh, hair color is green, something like that. But what if it's not green? That's because that gene is not expressed. And so your hair color is now black something like that and with more advanced technology it's becoming much more confusing i must tell you now it's very much confusing but again uh dna sequencing genotyping is a great tool for studying this bacteria what they can do and then you grow them in your environment laboratory environment and check if they are expressing all those genes they have or if not that's the phenotypic expression or expression analysis so in laboratory we do both we check the expression we check the dna if it's the if it has the answer or something if it uh, uh, relatable are the preventive measures for antimicrobial resistance similar to antibiotic resistance so anti when I'm saying antibiotic resistance, that's basically a group of antimicrobial resistance. So the basic difference is when I'm uh, saying antimicrobial, it's a broader term. In this term, it could be antibiotic, which means antibacterial. It could be antiprotozoal. It could be antiviral and so on, everything. So. Even if you were thinking about antimicrobial resistance, definitely the prevention mechanism are pretty much the same. That's because in any case, if it's a bacteria, if it's a virus and everything, as I said, if you get infected and if you want the treatment, you will take the medicine and eventually some of the germs will get resistance. You can never avoid this resistance. They are very much smart. They will develop this resistance anyway. So the basic rule of preventing antibiotic resistance or antimicrobial resistance, whatever you say, it's our unconscious use of antibiotics. The less we use, the less we give the pressure to make them resistant. Do you think it is possible to reverse antibiotic resistance? That's one interesting question. Thank you. That's the thing I am working on. So so far, I haven't found anything which I can reverse that reverse my uh, resistance. But yeah, I would love to work on that and we're working on it. So even if we are not reversing or maybe we are reversing by different using different inhibitors or other technology, you have to have a way to fight this antibiotic resistance or uh, uh, keep it in uh, check. There are some products which do farm claim they use no pesticides and more. Do pesticides contribute to antibiotic resistance? 
usually not, but using too much pesticides can cause pesticide resistance, but usually these pesticides cannot cross resistant the antibiotics. But the problem with the farming is most of the antibiotics they use in farm are also used in human body. So these are not animal specific antibiotics. So now we encouraging to use these farms or uh, industries to use or invent more um, animal specific antibiotics so that they cannot cross react human antibiotics, something like that. Mm, how do you believe antibiotic resistance will further evolve over time? Definitely they will be evolved. As I say always, if you discover a resist, uh, discover an antibiotic, there that will be resistant soon, sooner or later. It's the it's the time, how much soon or how much later, something like that. Uh, as in the colonization of the Americas, because they may not have had any contact with foreign pathogen, would have benefited. Okay, that's an interesting thing, which is not actually um, in the context of antibiotic. Rather, it's um, if you have read the sepsis, the book. Uh, so the first chapter started with when the when people first got onto the uh, onto Australia and Australia biodiversity got uh, uh, devastated because of these invaders and it is always applicable for all cases. So definitely, but um, now people are too much mobile. We are going one place to another. We are traveling a lot, so it's very much possible that the antibiotics we are using or getting much more resistant in low income countries are spreading in the high income countries as well. So in that cases, definitely antibiotic resistance you have to consider or colonization, whatever you say. Definitely that's an influential thing. What do people who are allergic to certain antibiotics do if they have bacterial infection? They have to have uh, different antibiotics they uh, have to use. If you have like some people have penicillin um, allergy, so whenever you go to the hospital, they will take the allergy list. If you have injected penicillin or any type of drug or they are allergic to you, you have to have an alternative. Do you think humans immune system will ever evolve against new strain? Is there an example of this happening in the past? Yeah, definitely this uh, immunity is a great thing. That's because we are overcoming most of the infections by our immunity drug itself cannot actually do all the things. Your immune system, your immune cells need to be in action to work in those cases. That's why the AIDS patients are much more vulnerable to different infectious diseases rather than ours. That's because their immune system is too weak to you know, fight any uh, any pathogen. That's why they can die from pneumonia, which is caused by normal good bacteria, which is not uh, any um, pathogenic one or a highly pathogenic one. So uh, definitely. Um, but um, do we still need drugs or we can use only our immunity? That's a tricky question. I think it depends on so many factors, uh, depending on your immune system, what type of pathogen we are taking, their pathogenicity level and everything. Do you think if we are starting to say antibiotic resistant, there may be a chance of other pathogens of having resistance to medicine like that? Yeah, definitely. There is actually antiviral resistance. So in case of AIDS, um, it's one of the major challenges of uh, developing anti-HIV drugs. That's because these drugs are getting resistance very much quickly. So yeah, and virus, uh, viruses are much more evolving as we have seen in uh, COVID pandemic. There was Delta, Delta variant, um, initially was some other variants. So virus evolved too quickly. So they become resistant quickly as well. How can we deal with antibiotic resistance effect the best thing is to use antibiotics wisely, actually. Uh, and it is a collective effort, not you and I or individually can do this. All the nations and, and um, uh, uh, government, everyone have to work on that. Do you, think, <laughs> do you think that we can ethically justify using tests that haven't completed trials in cases of outbreaks, 2015 evil outbreaks? That's an ethical issue. Actually, that's a uh, debatable issue. That's that's why I asked. Is it 
ethical to do these experiments. And yes, it's not ethical in some cases, definitely not. But yeah, uh, definitely you can debate it. I don't know, um, but it's I, I would not say it's 100 percent ethical. How do giant viruses cause diseases if they are as big as bacteria? How can they evade uh, invade the cells? So we haven't found any as far my knowledge. I don't know if the giant viruses can cause human diseases, but they have been found in um, a fungal or algae body uh, or something like that. So they kind of live like a saprophyte and they have a specific um, even even uh, those viruses are a bit different from normal viruses. They have some metabolic pathway as well. That's an interesting topic. I think you should better read more if you are interested. Uh, how do you think we should be dealing with the prospect of a post antibiotic era, uh, uh, era? Could there be alternative treatment to antibiotic? Definitely face therapy is um, one of the options we are considering. We are trying to uh, develop new antibiotics. Maybe we can find some more new things, which is like um, personalized medicine or something like that. So one antibiotic is not working in you, might be working in your sister, something like that. In a post-antibiotic era, how severe would population fall be in a worst case scenario? Very severe. You will die from a, a rose bush scratch from football and anything. That's because we don't have any drug to treat those little things. Do you think pharmaceutical companies will eventually give up making antibiotics and in, if invest in an alternative? They're actually doing that because, as I said, the golden period, there were lots of small and large companies who, who were investing in developing antibiotics. Nowadays, only the large companies and only a couple of companies are investing on antibiotic resistance. As I said, that, that is not much profitable or that takes huge commitment of time and money for uh, develop a new antibiotic. So they are interested more in um, uh, investing in diabetic drug or cancer drug. That's because one one diabetic patient or one cancer patient has to take those drugs for a long, long time. It's not a course of antibiotic. How quickly does a bacterial resistance occur if a new antibiotic was developed? How long would it be? The, uh, before it has no effect. So that's an interesting thing. If you see the timeline, when the first antibiotic resistance gene was discovered, it was discovered before the antibiotic was discovered or at the same time point. So bacteria are very much uh, smart. They will uh, evolve the resistance very quickly, but definitely we have to try and it depends if it's uh, pathogenic or not or how uh, What's the chemical structure of the antibiotic? Is it very easier to make the resistance? That's why when there these studies do, there are some frequency of resistance studies and something like that. I think we are almost time. Do we have any more question? No, that's that was the last question. <laughs> Thank you so much for that talk, Nadiri. You can see by the number of questions how much interest you've generated and you've covered a huge amount of ground. So well done um, for people who are interested in attending to more of these talks. Do check out our website, the Balliol website. There are about three or four more talks in this series um, if you're interested. But Nadira, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone who participated for showing your interest as well. Good night from Bagel. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.